Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. It's uh, it's about four o'clock now, and uh, I have uh, quite a bit that I wanted to talk about. So I suppose I had better get started. Uh, let me begin by welcoming you all to the latest in uh, the current season of lectures by the curatorial staff here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of uh, distinguished guests here in the audience, including uh, members of the faculty from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Thank you all for coming. Last week, we had the pleasure of listening to Jay Jensen discuss his ongoing research in the field of portraiture in the context of contemporary American art. Uh, today, I'll do my best to follow his example uh, in my discussion of a very different topic. My name is Stephen Salel, and my position here at the museum is the Robert F. Lange Foundation Research Associate for Japanese Art. For the past two years, I've been collaborating with Sean Eichmann, the curator of Asian art, in a series of exhibitions about shunga, that is, Japanese erotic art. Today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the current um, endeavors in that project. At this point, let me say that, like the exhibitions themselves, this lecture deals with sexually graphic material. It is not intended for listeners below the age of 18, nor is it intended for listeners who find frank discussions of sexuality to be offensive. I should also say, however, that this is intended to be an introspective, analytical approach to the topic of erotic humor. And so for those listeners who are expecting a presentation that is both titillating and knee-slappingly funny, um, I beseech your patience and understanding. It might not be that hilarious. Uh, the, the author, E.B. White, is known to have said, analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. The few people are interested and the dog and, and, and the frog ends up dying. Uh, my, my goal here is not to help you laugh at erotic humor. It's either funny or it's not, and what I say about it wouldn't make much difference. Rather, though, I'd like us to recognize when a work of Shunga, Shunga has comical intents. And I'd like us to understand the cultural sophistication that underlies that humor. Because without such awareness, erotic artworks, particularly those produced in Japan during the 19th century, can be incredibly offensive. And as my disclaimer was meant to convey, we here at the museum are doing our utmost to prevent viewers from reacting to the artwork in that sort of a negative way. Before I discuss the current status of our work uh, in the field of Shunga, I'd like to quickly summarize the accomplishments of our first year into the project. From November of 2012, through March of this year, we held the first of our three exhibitions, Arts of the Bedchamber, Japanese Shunga, which dealt with the development of Japanese erotic art during the late 17th and 18th centuries. The exhibition focused on various social issues surrounding erotic art, including Japan's sex industry, and the unique way in which gender was defined in early modern Japanese society. Some of the artists featured 
in that exhibition included the pioneers of Japanese woodblock printmaking, such as Kishikawa Moronobu, Suzuki Harunobu, and Kitagawa Utamaro. Arts of the Bedchamber was a turning point for the Department of Asian Art. In conjunction with that exhibition, we produced a bilingual website that included all of the artwork and text found in the gallery, as well as several video podcasts that discussed the, the overarching themes of the show. Since then, we've been able to produce several other websites to make our exhibitions and research projects in the field of Asian art available to an international audience. We most recently did a website in conjunction with the Art History Department at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. We've also been publishing our research about Shunga in scholarly journals. Last March, my article on the issue of gender, as reflected in Japanese erotic art, appeared in Orientations magazine. Over the past several months, the entire Department of Asian Art has been diligently working on a book about Shunga, which will be published by Rizzoli in the autumn of 2014. And in less than two weeks, Tongue in Cheek, Erotic Art in 19th Century Japan, the sequel to Arts of the Bedchamber, will open to the public. As with last year's show, in this exhibition, we intend to take a very sober, careful look at the sexual culture of 19th century Japan and attempt to determine the ways in which that culture evolved in response to various factors, such as technical developments in the publishing industry, the increased presence of foreigners in Japanese society, and the public's increased tolerance for sexually explicit artwork. As we did last year, we've produced a website that features all the artwork and text found in the gallery. Although the site is still under construction, if you'd like to have a preview of the site, the address is shunga.honolulumuseum.org slash 2013. In the October issue of Orientations magazine, I published an article about one of the works in this coming exhibition, an erotic text named Oeyama by the artist Utagawa Kunyoshi. If you have an opportunity to pick up a, car, uh, a copy of the article, of course, I strongly suggest it. Um, a, um, a very plain commercial endorsement there, forgive me. Uh, for my talk today, I'd like to give a brief overview of the article because I believe that this artwork by Kunyoshi represents many of the larger artistic and sociological issues with which this exhibition as a whole grapples. In particular, I think that Kuniyoshi's text offers an example of what happened at the dawn of the 19th century, when the initial novelty of Shunga as a genre begins to fade, when viewers become increasingly desensitized to images of sexuality, and when Japanese artists have to struggle ever further to revitalize the public's interest in erotica. They did so in three ways. One was by utilizing cutting-edge printmaking techniques. Uh, these included vivid, ostentatious color palette, uh, 
books with uh, flaps that were built into the pages and that could be moved to reveal hidden imagery underneath. And uh, some publishers even went so far as to produce articulated prints, uh, which are essentially paper puppets. I suppose that you're imagining what an erotic paper puppet looks like. <laughs> this is one of the pieces that we feature in the exhibition. Uh, another way in which Shunga artists revitalized the genre was by incorporating subject matter from popular culture, particularly tales of the supernatural that had risen to popularity throughout Japan in the mid-18th century. Here's a, a text by the artist Utagawa Kunisada, in which male and female genitalia are represented as goblins, ogres, and other monsters. Here in America, uh, there's been a recent trend in which uh, adults will get dressed up in sexy outfits uh, for Halloween. Uh, but in fact, the conflation between erotica and the paranormal is as old as it is international, as we see here. The last way in which 19th century artists reinvigorated the genre of erotica was by making it ever more provocative and thereby shaking viewers out of their complacency. In order to do that, and this is one of the darker sides of the exhibition that we deal with this year, uh, Shunga had to venture into taboo subjects such as rape, necrophilia, and bestiality. Artists accentuated the provocative nature of these discussions by depicting the figures in a particularly grotesque, lurid style. And while these three approaches indeed succeeded in recapturing the public's attention at that time, they simultaneously made the artwork all the more challenging for us the audience in the 21st century to understand and appreciate. For example, regarding the subject of my talk today, the erotic text Oeyama, uh, which Utagawa Kuniyoshi published in 1831. One of the only times it has been mentioned in scholarly discussions of Shunga has been in regards to Kuniyoshi's, quote, transgressive attitude towards sexuality. And the image used to illustrate that discussion was this one. I don't think anybody here would disagree that it's a pro provocative and disturbing image. When I submitted my article to Orientations Magazine, in which this image is the, uh, the, the opening image. Um, it was described by the staff there as the gang rape scene. Actually, uh, to clarify, uh, it does not depict a rape. Um, and in the upcoming exhibition, uh, I take time to discuss the iconography in 19th century Shunga uh, in a way that helps us to differentiate between images of sexual violence and something like this, which is rather extreme, but is actually simply an orgy. Um, the, um, the, 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 the artwork here obviously conforms to the trends in 19th century Shunga. 
This startling image is hidden uh, beneath flaps that initially present an entirely different image. That initial image, uh, as we can see, um, um, there are um, characters in it who are uh, demons and um, strange looking creatures. It's, uh, the subject matter is from a supernatural story. And also in, in accordance to the trends of the 19th century Shunga, there's a lot of visual chaos and aggression in this sexually explicit imagery that is certainly to some extent grotesque and difficult <coughs> to look at. It may be difficult for us to notice at first when we are looking at this book, but underneath these qualities of Kuniyoshi's work lies a keen sense of humor, and that humor is based upon surprisingly sophisticated literary and art historical references. So at the risk of killing the frog, as E.B. White says, um, I'd like to take a look at the mechanics of that humor. The name of Kuniyoshi's text, Oeyama, brings to mind an entry in the most famous of Japanese poetry anthologies, the Hyakunin Ishu, known in English as 100 Poems by 100 Poets. Some of you may remember, uh, but from August 29th through October 27th of this year, I displayed a rotation of woodblock prints by Kuniyoshi in the Lange Gallery, and those prints illustrated works from this poetry anthology. In that rotation, alongside the prints by Kuniyoshi, I also displayed this hand-painted version of the anthology. On the right side of, of this, uh, on, on the right page of this book, we see a poem by the author Koshibu no Naishi, dating to the early 11th century. The poem reads, By Mount Oe, the road to Ikuno is far away, and neither have I beheld nor crossed its bridge to heaven. Like Ikuno and the so-called bridge to heaven, Amano Hashidate, Mount Oe, pronounced in Japanese as Oeyama, is a geographical location in western Japan near the city of Kyoto. I realize that this map is a little bit difficult to see, uh, but um, I'm, I'm showing here in the lower right corner uh, the city of Kyoto, which is surrounded by several um, important mountains. Um, to its uh, northeast, uh, Mount Horai and Mount Hie, and to the distant northeast, in the upper left corner of this map, Mount Oe. The poem is essentially a solemn expression of physical separation, loneliness, and longing. And like other works found in the Hyakunin Ishu anthology, it exemplifies a subtle beauty of Japanese waka poetry. Sadly, though, even in early modern Japan, subtle beauty was easily disregarded. And so when Kuniyoshi illustrated this poem in his suite of prints, he included a curious figure, an enormous red demon, accompanied by a young female attendant. 
This figure arises from some of the supernatural literature that was so popular during the 18th and 19th century that, in fact, it totally transfigured some of the literature from pre-modern Japan. Koshikibu no Naishi's poem about Mount Oe, in particular, came to be associated with two legends that center around the heroic historical figure Minamoto no Yorimitsu, known also as Minamoto Raiko, <coughs> and his four lieutenants, known honorifically as the four celestial guardians. In one legend, the demon king, depicted it in Kuniyoshi's image here, uh, the demon king known as Shuten Doji raids the city of Kyoto, kidnaps several maidens, and brings them back to his lair on Mount Oe. Uh, this, uh, these illustrations I'll be showing from here are from an illustrated book uh, from that time period. Uh, in despair, the, the emperor who uh, was residing at that time in Kyoto summons Yorimitsu and the four celestial guardians and asks for their aid in, in rescuing the women. The heroes begin to scour Mount Oe for Shuten Doji's lair. At first, they meet one of the demon's female servants who they find ominously washing blood-stained clothes, presumably those of the demon's victims, in a mountain stream. Eventually, they encounter the demon in person, and here begins an intriguing game of mutual deception. Yorimitsu and his men, who in this image are shown in the lower left, uh, pretend that they are Yamabushi, uh, that is, uh, Buddhist monks who uh, practice uh, mountaineering, uh, traveling through the mountains as a form of ascetic practice. Uh, they, they pretend that they are Yamabushi who have become lost in the mountains, and they beseech the demon uh, for um, shelter uh, throughout the night. So in this game of deception, uh, Yorimitsu and his men uh, make the first move, and the score is now 1-0 with the heroes winning. Shuten Doji agrees to the request and invites the men to a banquet that evening that he and his minion are planning to hold. Unfortunately, uh, Shuten Doji fails to inform his visitors that the main dish of the banquet will be Yorimitsu and his men. So now, in this game, the table has been turned and it, it is the demon who's in the lead. Uh, Yorimitsu and his men accept the demon's invitation to the banquet, uh, but there at the banquet, uh, Yorimitsu spikes the wine and then serves it to all of his hosts. Uh, the, the wine um, has a powerful narcotic in it, and the, the demons, one by one, fall asleep. The soldiers then draw their swords, slay all of the monsters, oops, and rescue the kidnapped maidens. The game concludes, and the heroes prevail. In another legend, quite separate from the first one, Yorimitsu is at his home, uh, recovering in his bedroom, from a bout of malaria. 
his men, the four celestial guardians, are in the adjoining room when a mysterious figure enters into Yorimitsu's bedroom. Though he's only partly conscious, uh, Yorimitsu realizes that he's in danger. So he grabs his sword, slashes at the figure, and the intruder flees. Accompanied by his lieutenants, Yorimitsu gives chase, and the heroes eventually find themselves at the edge of an enormous pit, at the bottom of which lurks a monstrous spider, known as the Earth Spider, or in Japanese, the Tsuchigumo. The heroes decide to kill it, and that's the end of the story. It's not particularly long or particularly complicated. In the 18th century, these legends begin to crystallize. And in 1779, the author Toriyama Sekien published his extremely popular bestiary, The Illustrated 100 Demons from the Present and the Past which included both the legend of Shuten Doji, who we see here alongside one of his minions succumbing to Yorimitsu's tainted wine, as well as the legend of the Earth Spider. It's a bit difficult to see here, but this is a large mountain. In the center here is the Earth Spider, Oops, he's down here at the bottom of his pit, and at the edge of the pit are Yorimitsu and his men about to uh, dispatch uh, the, the spider. In the 19th century, Kuniyoshi reinterpreted these tales of Toriyama Sekien and infused them with dramatic vitality. Kuniyoshi was particularly interested in Yorimitsu's battle with the Earth Spider in this triptych, which is currently in the collection of the British Museum. He shows the heroes surrounding the spider's lair. Here at the bottom of the center sheet, the spider looks up menacingly at the warriors. <coughs> Above him is one of the warriors, King Toki, holding a giant tree branch with which he attempts to pierce the spider's web. At the top of the left sheet, the warrior Yasumasa holds a rope with which he plans to lasso the spider. Beside Yasumasa is Urabe no Suitaka, who draws a sword with which he plans to stab the spider. At the top of the right sheet, the warrior Watanabe no Tsuna holds a boulder with which he plans to squash the spider. And below Watanabe no Tsuna is Usui Sadamitsu, who holds a torch with which he plans to burn the spider. Ironically, with all of these weapons that the warriors are holding, I have absolutely no idea how the spider ends up dying. But however he ends up going, I imagine that the soldiers must have left quite an extraordinary mess behind them when they were finished. Another triptych by Kuniyoshi shows the events before this final confrontation. The four celestial guardians are entertaining themselves with a game of backgammon in the left and center sheets. And in the upper half of the right sheet, Yorimitsu sits in bed recovering from malaria 
while the earth spider looms up ominously behind him. In order to accentuate the drama of this image, Kuniyoshi adds a charging army of supernatural beings to the background. Now, this frenzied horde of monsters, uh, needless to say, has more meaning to it than merely that, but allow me to wait to the end of our discussion before I address that further meaning. So now we have uh, a basic understanding of the story of Oyama, the hero Yorimitsu and his retainers, the four celestial guardians, the drunken demon Shuten Doji, and the earth spider Tsuchigumo. So now let's take a look at how this narration has been lampooned in works of Japanese erotic art. In particular, I'd like to contrast two erotic parodies of Oyama, one produced by the artist Okumura Masanobu around 1739, and the other one, of course, Kuniyoshi's Oyama, published almost 100 years later in 1831. Masanobu was active during the golden era of the Yoshiwara, the licensed brothel district on the outskirts of Edo, that is modern day Tokyo, during the 18th century. As we discussed to some extent in the exhibition Arts of the Bedchamber, the Yoshiwara reinvented itself several times over its history of 350 years. Perhaps the most drastic transformation of the brothel district occurred after 1732, when swarms of locusts devastated crops around the Seto Inland Sea, causing the price of rice throughout the archipelago to skyrocket to as much as seven times its original price. The Kyoho famine, <coughs> as it came to be called, had tumultuous consequences on all aspects of Japanese society, including the Yoshiwara. Up until that time, clients visited the Yoshiwara district to spend money as lavishly as possible in a demonstration of their economic and social power. In response to this demand, the Yoshiwara had developed a very stratis stratified hierarchy of prostitutes, at the top of which were the Taiyu, women who exuded a kind of regal pride impeccable grace and an aloofness towards their clients that ironically fueled the desire of those men all the more. I guess if somebody doesn't want you, you want them all the more. Masanobu's parody of the tale of Oyama featured the demon king reincarnated as a Taiyu prostitute. Here she sits surrounded by lower ranking demonic courtesans whose names are all satirical references to famous women in early modern popular literature such as Oiso no Tora and Keiwai Zaka no Shosho, heroines in the tale of the Soda Brothers. Incidentally, some of you may remember that from June 27th through August 25th of this year, we displayed in the Lange Gallery a rotation of Japanese prints by Utagawa Hiroshige that illustrated the tale of the Soga Brothers. 
So to those of you who saw the rotation, some of these literary references may sound familiar. Uh, here on the right, we have one of the prints from that rotation featuring the courtesan Uiso no Tora, known also as Tora Gozen. During the 18th century, mere reference to the Yoshiwara or other such brothel districts throughout the country was enough to intrigue readers. But by the beginning of the 19th century, the Kyoho famine and other such economic crises had diminished the Yoshiwara's reputation for cultural sophistication. The women, such as the high-ranking Oiran prostitute depicted here on the right in Utagawa Toyokuni's Hanging Scroll, were still occasionally compared to demons and other supernatural creatures, but rather than simply as a way of expressing the women's transcendental beauty, these references to demons were often intermixed with cynical comments about how untrustworthy the women were. When we leap forward to the publication of Kuniyoshi's text Oeyama in 1831, therefore, it's not surprising that the story makes absolutely no reference to brothel districts and the women who populate the story appear to be either engaged in unlicensed prostitution or completely unconnected to the commercial sex industry. The first image in the book, for example, is a portrait of an ordinary woman sitting at home washing her laundry. Let me now focus on the main topic of our discussion here, decoding the humor of Kuniyoshi's Oyama. E.B. White's Warnings Be Damned, I'm Determined to Kill the Frog. Uh, this portrait of the laundry woman looks like a fairly boring way in which to begin an erotic book until we realize that it is, in fact, a parody of Shuten Doji's servant, who was, we saw in an earlier image, washing bloodstained clothes in a mountain stream. And if we look at the wall behind her, you'll see some graffiti, a vegetable and sea creatures with obvious phallic references, an umbrella, which in the context of Edo Japan has lots of romantic and erotic references as well. A couple of demons who are chanting, do it, do it. Uh, but what I want to point out in particular um, are two lines of poetry on the far side of the wall. I'm sure you remember the poem by Koshibu no Naishi, that we discussed a moment ago, uh, by Mount Oe, the road to Ikuno is far away, and neither have I beheld nor crossed its bridge to heaven. In Japanese, the poem goes, Oeyama Ikuno no Michi no to kureba Mada fumi mo mizu ama no hashidate. The Japanese in this version of the poem reads a little bit differently. Oe no ko ika no no hima no nagakureba mada yuri mo sezu ama no ashizuru which translates into English as Dirty little girl, what do you say? We've got a lot of free time, and we haven't yet had a heavenly romp. 
From that allusion to the literary origins of the tale of Oeyama, Kuniyoshi leads us to the supernatural reinterpretations of the story. Here we see the dramatic climax of the struggle between Yorimitsu and Shuten Doji. In the upper left corner of the composition, we see the Demon King, an image that Kuniyoshi has fairly carefully copied from the portrait by Toriyama Sekia. In front of Shuten Doji, we see his demonic minion, and facing them are the warriors <coughs> dressed in the attire of Buddhist monks. And a member of the party dances in the middle of the room to entertain the demon king. Now, according to the traditional story, the dancer is Yorimitsu himself. But since we saw five uh, warriors sitting on the right of the scene, I assume that Kuniyoshi is taking some artistic liberties and revising the story a bit, possibly having somebody else perform the dance. In the upper right corner of the image, Kuniyoshi has added an inscription that confirms that this is indeed a scene from the story of Oyama. It may be difficult to see, but down the center of each page, there's a line. And these are the edges of flaps uh, that are mounted on the page. When we turn the flaps, we end up with this disorienting image of an orgy. Uh, now it's time for us to decipher what's going on here. As in the previous image, there's a small inscription in the corner by Kuniyoshi that refers to another scene in the traditional tale of Oyama. And that inscription brings to mind this triptych we discussed by Kuniyoshi, published at about the same time as this erotic text. This is a sexual parody of that triptych. The woman laying on the ground represents the earth spider. The man poking her vagina with his finger is Kintoki trying to pierce the spider's web with his tree branch. Urabe no Suitake uh, rather than preparing to stab the spider with his sword, has impaled the woman in a different way. Yasumasa still holds a rope in his hands, but he decides to use it for autoerotic bondage rather than to lasso the spider. Usui Sadamitsu holds a candle rather than a torch. And poor Watanabe no Tsuna, who was previously prepared to squash the spider with a boulder, is now so tightly cramped into this claustrophobic composition that he's literally unable to do anything other than lean over the woman and glance down at her. Kuniyoshi's marvelous triptych has, in this way, inspired a rather witty bit of self-mockery. That self-referentiality is another aspect of 19th century Shunga that we discuss in the upcoming exhibition, by the way. Another image in Kuniyoshi's erotic text functions in the same way. Uh, this image uh, may look familiar to some, to, to, to some of you. On the one hand, it's a recreation of the conclusion of Oyama in which the demon lies semi-conscious while Yorimitsu and his lieutenants prepare to attack. But simultaneously, it's also a parody of the scene in which Yorimitsu lies 
semi-conscious in his bed, and the earth spider prepares to attack. The references uh, in Kuniyoshi's image uh, lean more towards the, the, the second interpretation. The woman is referred to in Kuniyoshi's text as Ms. Okumo, an obvious reference to Kumo, the Japanese word for spider. The man below her is named Yoritomo, a bastardization of the name Yorimitsu. Uh, Yoritomo is shown coughing rather than malaria. It seems that he's suffering from nothing more than a slight head cold. I mentioned previously that this triptych by Kuniyoshi has another layer of meaning to it, and I'd like to address that layer at this point. That interpretation, that, that other layer of meaning, is largely based on the image of goblins rioting in the background. Art historical scholars now agree that this print by Kuniyoshi makes reference to political events at that time, specifically to the shogunate's draconian campaign for censorship known as the Tempo Reforms, which occurred during the 1840s. The army of goblins are meant to represent the publishers of woodblock printed books mounting an assault on chief senior counselor Mizuno Tadakuni, who was largely responsible for that censorship campaign. What's ironic about this triptych by Kuniyoshi is that one target of Tadakuni's censorship campaign was, of course, erotica. And so Kuniyoshi used the story of Oyama both to criticize that censorship as well as to flaunt it. As we prepare for the second of our series of exhibition on Shunga, which opens in only about eight days, um, we face a lot of challenges. The political battle over erotic art fought between those who, like Tadakuni, feel that the artwork represents a threat to public decorum, or those who, like Kuniyoshi presumably did, feels that artwork that challenges viewers should be extolled rather than banned, that, that tension remains unresolved even today. I'm, I'm sure you've heard about the uh, exhibition of Shunga taking place over at the British Museum uh, these days. Um, there, it sounds like there is a certain amount of protest uh, that's going on there. And just about any article, any review that we read about the show um, tends to uh, talk about the show in reserved terms. While, uh, while the art historians uh, of today are hesitant to accept works of Japanese shunga, uh, especially those produced during the 19th century that include images of outlandish sexual behavior, uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, accurate judgment of the artwork's aesthetic and social merits uh, ought to be reserved before we make careful analysis of the works and have an open discussion about it. And that's really one of the main goals of these exhibitions that we're do doing here at the museum. The, the research that I've pre presented here uh, reveals some intentionally humorous aspects of uh, erotic art, as well as some literary and artistic illusions upon which that humor is based. Did I kill the frog? Yeah, probably. 
Um, but beyond our own individual emotional reactions to the work, be it um, laughter or offense or indifference, um, I, I, I think that we can appreciate the work, uh, hopefully we can appreciate the work um, for what it teaches us about the complex visual culture of 19th century Japan. I'd like to thank you all for coming here today to listen to my talk. And I'd also like to thank at this time all those people who made the current Shunga projects so successful, including uh, Stefan Yost and the Museum Administration, uh, Lisa Griffith and her communication team, all of the members of the Asian Art Department uh, who helped with the um, upcoming Shunga book, the um, upcoming exhibition, and everything in between. Larry Moria and his installation crew, the, the staff of the museum library, uh, Betsy Robb and the education department, including our marvelous staff of docents. And lastly, I'd like to thank Abby Algar, Taylor Chang, and the staff of the Dor Doris Duke Theater for allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you very much.